Welcome, Climate Viewers. My name is Jim Lee from Climate Viewer News. It is July 3rd, 2017, and tomorrow is our Independence Day in America, and I'm very excited about that. I hope you're all having a wonderful summer. Um, I'm over here at uh, climateviewer.com, and uh, this is a slash resonated, my about page. Um, going to have a really exciting show tonight. Oh, my God, this is going to be nuts. Um, we're going to be referencing weather modification history tonight, talking about space weather control and chemtrails from space. This is something I've talked about for quite a number of years. Uh, it seems to be catching on. I saw a great video. Uh, shout out, because I like to do um, good shout outs to good people to true stream media for their video antarctica is the key to controlling the weather watch that today and i uh, saw some great stuff in there about uh harry wexler and rockets and space weather control and controlling the entire planet's weather so I want to try to tie a bow on this, give you all some references. I did go to her video, um, and I didn't see any references for it. I went to their web, to their website as well. And me, I'm a reference kind of guy, you know. And I'm going to put all this stuff, stuff, of course, over here on weathermodificationhistory.com, and of course at climateviewer.com. And as always, um, if you guys would like to support me, I would really appreciate it. Um, in the details of this video are links to my GoFundMe and my PayPal. Uh, all this work uh, takes a lot of time, and I do appreciate all of your support. So let's get into it. This is just part one. We're going to do the past today. We're going to do the present and the future in the next two videos. Stay tuned at youtube.com slash Jim Lee Climate Viewer. And I uh, please subscribe over there. So let's dig in right away. So everybody talks about harp and everybody talks about chemtrails. The thing about climateviewer.com and myself is that I like to uh, keep it real, real. And tonight we're going to get super freaking real. Um, in her video, uh, she was referring to Her Harry Wexler and how he had made the discovery that basically rockets were screwing with the ozone and punching holes in the ionosphere. And this might not be a good idea because it could screw up all of the weather on the planet. And Harry Wexler came to this conclusion in 1962, just before he died. And apparently he was to give this speech. He never was able to do it. But regardless, today's a new day. And uh, those who forget the past are doomed to repeat it. So let's first start with the past. Now, I like to sum a lot of this up over here at weathermodificationhistory.com. Um, this is a, a labor of passion uh, and um, that I work on with a good friend of mine, Dominic Marama. You can see us both at the bottom of the page here. There you go. Get in contact with us if you need to. And uh, this is some fascinating stuff. So what we're going to do is I'm going to show you this. There's a timeline here. We're going to go through this thing as we pull apart this most dreadful weapon space weather space weather control now what i'm doing is i'm on the timeline i've hit filter timeline and i'm showing space weather right here so that everybody can follow along at home and that's on weathermodificationhistory.com all right so in her video she shows right here an article now i tried desperately to find this right before the video that's why this is starting very late tonight but guess what this is all recorded and you guys can, of course, share it around with everybody. And I will find this article in the near future. But at this point, it's kind of a moot thing. Scientists warn space age fuels may affect world's life by changing weather. Exotic fuels developed for the space age could re result in changes of weather affecting all life on Earth, according to Harry Wexler, the preeminent weather guy on the planet. <laughs> How preeminent? I would say pretty preeminent. 
there's Harry Wexler hanging out right in behind John F. Kennedy. <laughs> um, Harry had uh, talked about at one time, um, you know, melting the Arctic with nuclear bombs, uh, wrote some reports on geoengineering for JFK. Pretty, pretty important guy. And around 1962, he had come to the conclusion that maybe this rocket idea wasn't such a good idea. Um, he even um, cited a report called Modification of the Earth's Upper Atmosphere by Missiles, 10 September 1961, by Geophysics Corporation of America, Bedford, Massachusetts. This report is not public. I will be getting this. Um, shout out to the Black Vault. Hope you're watching this, homie. Um, and it gets kind of ugly kind of quick. And basically, he had come to the determination that, you know, at the very least, rocket exhaust was hurting, you know, the ozone layer. Near space experiments could go awry on no risk from Operation Argus. 1958, Project Westford, and Project Highwater. What are those? Over here on the timeline, he said Project Argus. Now, what most people don't know, there's this thing called the Partial Nuclear Test Ban Treaty, or the Limited Test Ban Treaty, as some people know it. But basically, it goes like this. There were a whole bunch of nuclear explosions. Operation Argus being a really important one. But there was also Hard Tag Teak, Starfish Prime, the K Project. Here's a link to the list of artificial radiation belts created as a result of all of these upper atmospheric nuclear explosions. Here's a link to the Partial Test Ban Treaty and something called the Christophilos Effect. Q first link. So this is called the Argus Experiment by Nicholas C. Christophilos. I believe it's Nicholas N. C. Christophilos at Lawrence Radiation Laboratory, University of California, Livermore. Everybody knows what the Lawrence Livermore National Lab is. It's the same place that Lowell Wood, Edward Teller, and Roderick Hyde came up with the modern uh, idea for geoengineering solar radiation management. Not a coincidence. So at the Argus experiment, he referred, Christophilos refers to an effect whereby electrons race from pole to pole and they bounce to and fro. Pretty sure we got a slide of that in here as well. Better yet, let's just pull up my heart page. Uno momento, por favor. I was going to show this at the end, but screw it. This is climateviewer.com slash harp, H-A-A-R-P. And you can see a nice little picture of it right there. So what we have. <laughs> Yay. Shout out to you, Paris Logan, writing for God. Uh, Greg Arnold and uh, Lori Armstrong in chat. Thank you for staying up late for with me. <laughs> um, yeah, the reason why you never catch me live is because until at least September, I, I'm going to like randomly do these videos. They will be on Sunday eventually. Um, but I may be moving this to like Friday night or it may be Saturday night. I don't want to nail it down just yet, but plan on come September, I will have this, you know, weekly show time nailed down a little better and it'll be announced on climateviewer.com and you'll know where it is and when. So anyway, back to the story. Um, right here, you can see that what they're saying is basically that when you put radiation in the space or, you know, trap a bunch of electrons in space, that they would bounce from pole to pole. And as they do that, they rain out at each pole, and that's called creating artificial aurora. Well, Christophilos had figured this out, you know, way back during the Argus times. 
and you know basically proposed what is now referred to as the Christophilos effect that you could actually use the Van Allen belts as a weapon, as a weapon system, as a bug zapper in the sky. Pretty scary stuff, in fact. Um, let's see right here. Nope, that's not it. I have a, another slide of that, and I believe it's right. Sure. There you go. And this is actually Christophilos explaining it himself. There's Christophilos. Christophilos shows how a magnetic field encompasses the Earth. When nuclear bomb is detonated, some of the radiation is trapped and travels along the magnetic force to point of opposite end of line, then spreads around the Earth in a thin shell of electrons. So here's the explosion. Boom, boom, boom. They spiral around the magnetic field lines, and basically radiation is trapped in space. Pause for liquid. This is from Jim Fleming's uh, Fixing the Sky, Checkered History of Weather and Climate Control. I will be compiling all of these links into a nice little article for you. So this is um, Christophilos explaining his you know, effect on the Argus. And you see right here, <laughs> note, 1958 data, space is radioactive. Boom. <laughs> Big surprise there. A blast in space. Epic test. This shows Argus right here in 1958. And it shows what it did with the magnetic field lines and all that. And that it could, that three separate times there was a complete radio blackout over the Pacific because of launches. What are they referring to? In here we have Project High Water where they dumped water in space. Project Westford, the Westford Needles. Um, and then a little later, there was some other stuff. We won't, I don't want to get too deep into that. Let's not get sidetracked. But regardless, let's go back to the where we were. So astronaut path is declared safe. Experts say rays of new belt create new peril. So what, it, what they're talking about here is these upper atmospheric nuclear explosions created artificial radiation belts that did not exist before. And they were like, oh, crap. Well, do we suck them out or we just keep creating more? Of course, they created more. So they did ban the nuclear explosions, but they had to continue, you know, screwing with the environment. Um, let's go over here. And this is where it really gets interesting. In the video that she, she had put forward, she kind of leaves it right at about, you know, the Wexler part. So the Wexler part, on the possibilities of climate control in 1962, Harry Wexler on geoengineering and ozone destruction. And, you know, basically Wexler, um, let's go back to this thing because there's a great quote in there. I think it's a little, there's the, one of the, one of the nuclear explosions. You can actually see the entire sky lit up and from Hawaii to California, they had no radio. <laughs> and I like this slide, the Van Allen belt, but how do you know destroying the inner Van Allen belt will create havoc until you try it? <laughs> you got to blow up the Van Allen belts, right? My God. So actually I think the quotes a little further up here. Here it is. Even in this day of in in this day of global experiments, such as the worldwide Argus electron seeding of the Earth's magnetic field at 300 miles height, man and machinery orbiting the Earth at 100 miles 17 times in one day, and 100 megaton bombs, are are we any closer to some idea of, of the approaches which could lead to the eventual solution to the problem of climate control? There is a growing anxiety that man is applying his growing energies and facilities against the power of the winds and storms may do so with more enthusiasm than knowledge and so cause more harm than good. Harry Wexler, 1962. Now he died in 1962. And he was basically warning that, you know, this idea 
of trying to modify the ionosphere and magnetosphere with electrons and nuclear bombs and rockets and their exhaust was a bad idea. And you think that, that people would listen to that, but it's clear to me, and this isn't mentioned in the true stream media video so that I, and I've tried to contact these people, of course, you know, everybody's impossible to contact, you know, and very busy, obviously, but hopefully one of you guys will help them see this video and maybe she can take the ball further. But regardless, the very next year, plasma seeding and magnetospheric modification begins. And that is literally, you know, the title here that create an artificial ion cloud in the interplan interplanetary space for studying the state of interplanetary medium sounding rocket experiments of may 1963 and i'm now doing more research on these sounding rockets it turns out that the earliest sounding rockets had started in the 50s by james van allen himself the guy who originally discovered the van allen belts and whom they're named after so as an, you know, you know, <laughs> a reporter tabulating evidence, this story just gets more and more fascinating to me. Every time I read, it's just so much that is that the public has never heard. And it's fascinating to me. So this is Star Wars, guys. This is Star Wars. This is important because when we get to the future video, you guys are really going to freak out. So, we can officially say, according to this picture right here, that 1963, that when they had banned nuclear explosions because of Argus, because of the Christophilos effect that, you know, had been well described, that they had switched gears and they said, you know what? Even though Wexler is saying screwing with rockets will affect weather on a worldwide basis. Should we stop doing that? No, they decided to go full bore and create patch of aurora ionization and atmospheric heating on the ground because they've trapped energetic particles by releasing a cloud of plasma released by satellite. So Rocky goes up, satellite releases chemicals, chemicals cause patch of aurora ionization and atmospheric heating interesting big freaking plasma cloud of metal particles in space causes heating at the poles write it down there's the picture so why is this important because he wexler warned rockets in space and their exhausts are going to screw with the weather on a worldwide basis. These guys said, we want to screw with the ionosphere using rockets and plasma clouds. And this is also not mentioned in that video. Pollution of the upper atmosphere by rockets. W.W. Kellogg, the Rand Corporation, 1964, the year after this entry. Interestingly enough, this report estimates the amount of various constituents that would have to be continually injected by rockets into the upper atmosphere in order to double the worldwide natural concentrations there. Involved are the involved in the calculations, but I'll skip all that. And they're talking about how long they said that it would take um, in order to keep doubling these chemicals, it would take 10 to the third to 10 to the five Saturn type rockets injecting 100 tons of exhaust above, above 100 kilometers. So that's completely ridiculous. The possibility of doubling CO2, H2O and NO um, would require 100 tons of exhaust, you know, th thousands of times. On the other hand, this is important. This was said two years after he died, two years after he warned. It's the Rand Corporation. On the other hand, and let me zoom in because I want everybody at home to see this. 
stuff. On the other hand, a few hundred small rockets per year, each containing 10 kilograms of chemical would probably double the NA content. Similarly, less than two such rockets per year would be expected to double the lithium content. These last conclusions have implications for future tracer experiments using these substances. So, <clears throat> this is interesting. This is a very interesting paper for me. Pollution of the upper atmosphere by rockets. Somehow we got from Wexler, from blowing up the, the sky with nukes, recognizing that it would affect the environment, Wexler warning, um, you know, that this would be a problem. And then we have the Rand Corporation going, the hell with the warning, let's do this stuff. And saying specifically in 1964, lithium. Why is this interesting? Why is this so interesting, Jim? Because that's what they've been doing all the way up to today. Over here on the NASA site today, this still, it's now completely public, no shame, put it in your face. Sounding rockets are in. This is how they've been doing it. Vapor tracers, tracers, clouds, and trails. And what's on the trails page? Poker flat rocket range, TMA trimethyl aluminum, vapor trails from sounding rockets, lithium, and there's one. Image of daytime lithium trail near 68 miles altitude from sounding rocket launched from Wallops Island, Virginia. The sounding rockets are now in your face. Barium. This is a barium cloud with a TMA cloud and a lithium cloud, like all in one shot. Pretty impressive. So the point I'm trying to make here is, Harry Wexler tried to warn the world that, you know, these sounding rockets, they would be a bad idea. Here's the thing right there. Wexler's Rosetta Stone, no linking Chapman Wolf, rocket fuel, and ozone destroying reactions triggered by chlorine and bromine catalysts. And he was specifically referring to how, um, you know, the, the exhaust from these rockets are going to destroy the planet, <laughs> are going to destroy the ozone. It wasn't until the 70s that they finally started coming around going, hey, the ozone hole is a problem. He warned us, you know, 10 years earlier. And of course, the Rand Corporation thought it was a great idea to really pick out lithium and let's rock with it. So let's go back to the timeline and do some real history. After Wexler said no, after they said yes, after pollution lithium was chosen, they went with it. Here you go. February 1964. Artificial strontium and barium clouds in the upper atmosphere. Whole bunch on that. Next, solar power satellite, gonna skip that. Observation of the development of striations in large barium ion clouds, 1972. Picture on that. Rome Air Development Center Advanced Research Projects Agency. That's Air Force, guys. Coming back, rocket energy beams create artificial aurora, artificial aurora conjugate rocket, rocket born electron accelerator, ARPA's project secede, barium cloud releases, links on that, pictures there. And you can see all of their different ones, olive 336 kilograms, spruce 48 kilograms, plum 148 kilograms, and these are kilograms of barium. So 
for years and years and years and years and years. And here it is. NASA Skylab knocks out radio communications over the Atlantic. And that's what was referred to in the slide there. And here's the launch. They go over and as it's going into space, boom, radio knocked out everywhere. Military goes, ionospheric hole affects radio transmission. Mandela et al. 1975 for all you research nerds. This is a problem. Punching holes in the ionosphere can knock out radio on a worldwide basis. Why don't we use it as a weapon? High explosive shaped barium charges pound ionosphere, 1974. And that leads us up to NMOD, where as a result of the Operation Popeye stuff in Vietnam with the cloud seeding, you know, they had banned weather warfare. So we're going to stop right about there as far as these barium clouds. I could go on for days. Here's a great one from 1978. We'll go just one pass there. NASA creates clouds over Alaska in conducting weather experiment. This is called Project Cameo. And they were dr dumping barium uh, releases. NASA said barium is a harmless chemical that dissipates in space. Barium has been previously released in the atmosphere um, from rockets, but never before from a satellite and never quite as high above the Earth. And this was uh, something called the Sea res I believe this may have had something to do with Sea res but we will make that speculation. That's coming in the next video. Let's do that for the next video. So anyway, um, and water hole there. Let's go back. So now we've kind of done the history from 1950 to about 1978. And this is where it gets real interesting because that's when it becomes clear that messing with the ionosphere on a global scale has global impl implications for weather underneath. This is from New Scientist, 1976. Um, but perhaps the most exotic form of geophysical warfare concerns tampering with the electrical behavior of the ionosphere. Techniques for disturbing radio communication by punching holes in the ionosphere with nuclear explosions have been long discussed. So two, proposals for opening up lethal windows in the ionosphere to let in the short wavelength ultra radi ultraviolet radiation, which is known to damage biological systems, causing skin cancers in man and damage to crops. What is new is the suggestion that the natural waveguide between the ionosphere and the earth could be used to propagate very low frequency VLF radiation through it in such a way as to affect the behavior of individuals' own brain activity. From this day forward, I want you to look everybody in the eye, calls you conspiracy theorists talking about harp and chemtrails. And I want you to tell them. Chemtrails from space, VLF waves, and screwing with your brain all linked together. This is New Scientist 1976. Dominic, you're the man for finding that one, brother. You're the man. So, today, the present. We will go over in the next video. Antarctica truly is a wide open space for all kinds of atmospheric exploration with VLF radiation. And we have been seeing a lot of sparks and spikes coming up on the mimic Shout out to Dabu77 and others who've mentioned these. I am watching. Um, but yeah, these are super darn locations around there. And there are many different stations and instruments all over, as far as the Falkland Islands there, all over Antarctica. And we will go into all of these in great detail in the next video because... 
There are a lot. And we will get to the ionospheric heaters in the next. Because the ionospheric videos have not been invented yet. We are still. This is climateviewer.org. Please check it out. Um, we're still in the past here for this video. So we're going to stay there. Yes. Mind control. That's where we left off. So let, let's just let's explore that one thing from 1976. Still in the time zone. pre in mod sky's the limit as they say vlf radiation what is argus the christophilos effect harry wexler and vlf radiation have to do with screwing with your brain over here on climateviewer.com slash harp and i will drop this link in chat for my homies Over here, you can go down to the bottom a little bit further down, and I've got a whole bunch of details on how heart works and the link. Ionospheric heaters affect your brain. And we go to right here. This is the Russian government, Russian Duma, Russian parliament concerned about U.S. plans to develop new weapon. They say that they are under the high-frequency active auroral research program HARP. that they would create weapons capable of breaking radio communication lines like we talked about just now with the sounding rockets and the dumping barium and lithium in space um create weapons of capable of breaking radio communication lines and equipment installed on spaceships and rockets Provoke serious accidents in electricity networks and in oil and gas pipelines and have a negative impact on the mental health of people populating entire regions. So, new scientist says shooting VLF waves into the magnetosphere along the Van Allen belt using VLF and ELF can screw with your brain. The Russian government, the Russian government agrees and they are experts on this topic. So they demanded that an international ban be put on large scale geophysical experiments like, yes, like this. So we are only in the past for this video. And what, what, what have we learned from this? By shooting a bunch of nuclear explosions into the sky, they realized that that caused radiation to bounce from pole to pole. It would heat the poles and create artificial aurora. And that it created artificial radiation belts. Let me go up here and let's bring that one up real quick because it's kind of important. So right here. There's a nice video down here. If you bring that thing up, it'll show you all of the nuclear explosions that occurred. And you can start watching them going off. There were 2,053 of them, all of which are mapped on climateviewer.org. Um, but here is the inner Van Allen belt protons down here, outer Van Allen belt electrons in purple, new belt orange, interstellar matter. This new belt was an artificial radiation belt that was created by an upper atmospheric nuclear explosion. That's Argus. There's Project K. And what is this? Who knows it's not coming up. Oh, it's an actual footage of an explosion. Yeah, so you can actually see the upper atmosphere. Boom, there's a nuclear bomb in space. Makes like a big... Here, let's back it up just there. Boom, nuclear bomb in space references provided right there on weather modification history.com so these upper atmospheric nuclear explosions created these artificial radiation belts let's see if the page is still there there they are list of artificial radiation belts and when they were created 
Now, of course, that's not all of them by far. Um, let's see if the Christophilos effect is still on here. They there was this great thing on the Christophilos effect on here, and they just deleted all of it. Boy, I'm really going sideways now. But anyway, so this is on uh, Wikipedia here. Not everything on Wikipedia is complete crap. That's pretty good. And will they talk about his effect or should I have to type it? I should have to type it, of course, because nothing's ever easy. Boom. Effect. All right. And there's the Christophilos effect. It is still there. So if you really want some funky details, go back through the revision history on this article. Because in case you guys don't know about astroturfing and uh, Wikipedia, people are constantly editing this stuff. And so people will put stuff in and then it's immediately ripped out. I don't even see the revision. Anyway, view history. There you go. Um, this stuff's highly fought over. So as you can see, let's see right now. Right now, the article currently sits at, let's see, 6,730 bytes. Where was it? Right here, 9,000. And a whole big chunk of stuff was taken out by this guy, and it says clean up. <laughs> but somebody revised some stuff out. Anyway, this one's pretty interesting. I believe this is the one. But anyway. Oh, man, I'm in the weeds now. Anyway, Christophilos effect. So, artificial radiation belts created. Christophilos pointed it out. Um, Wexler warned about it. Rand Corporation loved it. Love it! NASA loves it to this day because lithium's so fun. And uh, new scientists and others agree that now the in 1976 that when will i be posting this video this vo video is being posted now <laughs> this vote this video will be will be permanently here as soon as this show is over with and i do suggest you guys spread this around because i'm sick of people talking about aluminum and barium only coming out of delta airlines and not talking about chemtrails from space <laughs> so this is chemtrails from space part one chemtrails from space affecting your brain since 1976 available at weathermodificationhistory.com so that is a serious problem right there guys and this is just the beginning of the story. Just the beginning of the story. So, any questions in chat before I before I kick this thing off the air? Practically Horson's late. Stupid. What's stupid? What are we doing here? Yes, Russia has a whole lot of stuff that mirrors everything we're doing. I will get into that in the next video when we go into the present. Um, we'll talk about Sura and um, a bunch of the radio wave propagation stuff that Russia did from you know the 60s or the late 70s on. Um, I will definitely be covering Russia, even the woodpecker stuff. Yeah, totally. What do I know about the Strato Cruiser? Um, I got a great video on the Strato Cruiser. It's on my YouTube. Uh, just come to my channel. That's right, cheer. In fact, I have the best video on the Strato Cruiser. So let's go to this. Do, 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 vid. Oh, not video manager. Clicking too fast. Way too fast. All right, there we go. Videos, and it is right here. David Key's Strato Cruiser. Let me drop that link for you, homie. Boom, and 
delivered. That's personal service, brother, man. <laughs> All right. So, um, well, guys, that is Kim Trills from Space Part One, the past. Harry Wexler warning about rockets screwing with the global atmosphere. The scientists saying, we love it. Great idea. More, please. And uh, Kim Trills from Space, aluminum barium and rockets. Spread it around. We're going to do part two probably this week, maybe even tomorrow. It'll be a little later. But uh, I did a whole lot of reading, a little too much reading. I was just, I, I found a couple of these articles tonight and I just dug in. I have a ton of other um, links that I cannot wait to get to in the next video. But we're going to do this in three parts. So it's not completely overwhelming. This is Chemtrails from Space. 1950 to 1978 the next one we're going to do 1978 to present and then the next one we're going to do what the future holds because it's pretty freaking nuts all right guys i love you mean it um again i am jim lee i'm at climateviewer.com slash resonated i do appreciate all your support um you know i link in the details gofundme.com slash climate viewer or jim at climate viewer.com is my email and my paypal I do appreciate your support my websites are advertisement free all of my software i create like climate viewer 3d is completely open source and i do all of this for free it is about the love of the truth and personally i <laughs> this stuff it's just so fascinating i mean jesus to, to 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 learn about weather in school and then to find out that so much of it is controlled with all of this star trek's insanity uh it's just pure insanity and uh, we're going to have to dig through the present in the next video because if I start digging through this map today, this video will quickly grow by 15 hours. <laughs> All right, guys. I love you, mean it. And uh, unless someone like you cares a whole awful lot, nothing's going to get better. It's not. Check me out over here. Here's all my details at the bottom of climateviewer.org. Please spread this video around. A lot of people really need to get this. I've been talking about chemtrails from space for about three years now, about how rockets are really affecting our weather on the ground. And we know it to be intentional, not just like people launching, you know, digital cable and 5G and, you know, satellite TV that they're screwing with the weather. Yes, they're punching holes in the ionosphere and they're pooping on us. And it's screwing with all the weather. True. But these guys, even in the 70s, had already taken it too far. Just wait till you see the next video. Spread this around. I love you guys. Um, that's my story, and I'm sticking to it. And uh, you guys have a wonderful summer. Stick around for the next video. Subscribe, Jim Lee, Climate Viewer on YouTube. And uh, see you next time.